Okay, morning everyone. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, does everybody know about the streets, street tree surveying? Is everyone aware of why we're doing it? Um, just no. to give you some um, figures right now, we've um, surveyed 1,516 trees. And there's just under a thousand on tree plotter. So I'm slowly inputting all the data that I have. So we're getting there. So that's quite a good number. Next slide, please. That was the uh, the on street. Uh, yeah, the face to face training that we've I've done in the past. So we'll be doing some more um, in September and October. I've just got to sort out some dates. Um, I don't think we have 31 surveyors at the moment. We've got about 19 surveyors. So we really do need some more if we're going to, con to continue with this survey. Next slide, please. everybody gets issued with equipment um yeah so we can roughly do about six trees an hour tony and myself we managed to do was it about 20 yes we were very lucky though because the trees were all really close together and they weren't too difficult no so we did about 20 in one hour but that was working as a team and it was quite good it was very satisfying at the end. Yeah. Um, okay, next slide, please. If you've got any questions, put your hand up. So we used the Bloomington protocol and we added a couple more variables to the list. Yep, and we did hands with wood. I was nine, was it 2021 or was it 2020? We, we did the um yeah i think it was 2020 i think it was we were the first lot weren't we yeah and it was also in the middle of covid so we had to kind of do all the social distancing for the training yes okay next slide please so this is some of the um information we are collecting um crown die back uh, there's a lot of street trees that have died back at the moment due to the weather conditions. Um, so that's one of the 43 variables, but some of you have already have done some of this so that you'll know. So, so for this one, you're looking at the overall condition of the canopy. And even now I've noticed quite a few street trees that have some die back at the top so really it's re so it's looking at it and deciding what percentage of the die back um, you choose it doesn't have to be a hundred percent accurate it's what you see in front of you uh, next slide please um I'm sure you've seen this quite a lot. The ones who have been doing surveying, a lot of damage in the lower trunk from mainly streamers. And so that's V12 and V13. Um, a lot of it can be from children, well, no, people, I should say, pulling branches off that are low down and causing the damage. I've also noticed there's damage from the actual tree ties when you've taken them off and there is a great big hole in it from that uh, next slide please um, yep the overall tree condition again uh, I'm trying to think what else I can say about that well this one is a liquid dunbar and it's in good condition if the tree is missing if it has been removed by Kia. 
we always record it as absent or if it has been replaced and, and it has the new cage around it we still record it as absent but we don't survey the new tree so we can't get to it next slide please So the one on the left is in a fair condition and then the one on the right is not doing so well. You get to know which ones are good, which are fair and which are poor. Next slide, please. And this is the different planting area types. We've had to translate them into English. Uh, my favourite always is Bump Out, and there's a street in Cottridge. Oh, somebody has just put, cannot see the slides. Oh, uh, I, that's I, cheap. I guess, I mean, I, I, I can see the slides. I'm, I'm not sure why that would be that they can't see what you're presenting uh yeah. well, to you um <clears throat> let me think maybe is it's it, on a phone is it an iphone yeah uh the other thing to do is is look at the look at the top of the screen um there should be a green bar that says you are viewing tanya's screen and in view options um you might need to try and pick something else so maybe side by side mode, because um, sometimes if the view mode highlights yeah. just the speaker. Uh, other than that, the only thing I could suggest is maybe just leave the meeting and come back in again. Might that sometimes re rectifies it? Okay. Good luck, Jeevan. <laughs> okay. So um, planting area types. Um, yeah, favourite one is bump out. Has anyone else seen a bump out? Oh, they're very rare, Nina. I've seen like one or two. They are. Yeah, the only one I found is in Sturchley. But yeah, um, everything else is kind of self-explanatory. Um, next slide, please. This is one of the variables that we've added on. And because of the parking problems we have in Birmingham. So the photos I added on to the training to so people so we get better understanding what to choose. Next slide, please. And again, that's the, the rest of it. In where I live in I live next to Wheelie Castle. Number five is the major issue, where they park on the pavement right next to the tree. And number three. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, do you want so me to? So this is the. Yes, please. Could you do this bit? Yes. Okay. So this is the statistics. Um. So um, Nina and I have been through all this huge spreadsheet that we've downloaded from tree plotter because as nina was explaining we've done over a thousand trees but not all of them have gone on to tree plotter yet um and when we did this last october good grief nina a year ago unbelievable yeah um so we we just took a, a snapshot in time really of everything that was on tree plotter so we had 754 trees um, and we know that there's more that need to go on. So um, Nina and I have got a reasonable understanding of Excel and pivot tables and things like that. But this um, kind of the caveat to this is that actually if we had somebody who knew about Power BI and could do some like really sophisticated analysis on all of this data, we'd be able to get loads more information out. So what we've got here is really an interim um, kind of understanding of the information that we've got. Um, but, you know, it's really easy using tree plotter and Excel. So, you know, we, we kind of, we had a bash, didn't we? So we did. 
Okay, so tree condition. So Nina's showed you pictures of, of what the different tree conditions look like. And it's really positive that almost 70% of the newly planted street trees, so that's trees that have been in the ground for about five years, are, are doing well, they're in good condition. However, that does mean that just over 30% aren't doing as well. So 2.5% of the trees were dead at the time of inspection. So in just five years, those trees have died. 7.4% um, were poor. So as you saw from that picture, you know, maybe the top half of the tree is um, dead. Um, we, we had quite a few that were vandalized and were struggling to get back from that. But 18% um, were in fair condition. So that could be that it had just been a, a very dry summer um, and that they weren't doing um, as well as they could be doing. So, um, you know, we don't know. And it could be that the ones that were in a fair condition could go on to, to, to do better and become good in the future. So that was really interesting. So 70% of the trees were doing well. OK, so the next thing we looked at, um, and if anybody's doing the level two course, um, you'll know all about genus, um, which is um, when we when we're talking about trees, we clump them together, as we do with kind of all plants and animals, really, into groups. And so the genus is a um, is a group of trees and then um, from the genus you have the species so when we're talking about um, well let me ask you so from here we saw that 101 of the trees were prunus genus so does anybody know um, and you might have to shout out for this one um, what what kind of trees those are that are prunus Any suggestions? Cherries. Plums, cherries. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, so 101 of those. So that's by far the largest. The second largest group was tilia. So anybody got any suggestions for what tilia could be? Limes. Yes, yes, absolutely, limes beautiful big trees then um we've got liquid amber and in fact that was one of the photos that um nina showed us and then we've got malus so any suggestions what malus is apple yes absolutely um and then the next biggest group um were betula so um anybody got a clue for what betula are Birches. Birches, yes, perfect. Right, okay. So um, you'll see it's it's quite a mix. You'll see that there's one almost, and that's an elm tree. So in the last five years, we've planted an elm, which I imagine is the um, one that's resistant to Dutch elm disease because quite a few places have been trying these new elms out, which is great. OK, so looking at some of the other kind of um, trees genus that we've got on here, we're talking about street trees. OK, and in Birmingham, we can all picture on the whole what most of our streets look like. A lot of Victorian terraces, um, a lot of quite narrow streets, although we do have some quite wide kind of boulevard areas. So let's just have a look at Meta Sequoia. Does anybody know what metasequoias are? I'm sure there's people on the level two course. Conifer. Conifer. Yes, what kind the are they? Sequoia makes me think of redwoods and giant yes. trees. Yes, absolutely. And Simon's put in the chat, it may dawn on someone. So I think he's <laughs> trying to allude to the fact that they're dawn redwood. Dawn redwood, redwood uh-huh. So these are big trees. Um, and so we've got to hope that they've been planted in a street that can accommodate <laughs> really, really big trees. 
Um, also on the list, we've got 10 trees which are phagus. Now, phagus are beech trees. Um, and I think beech is known as the queen of the woods. It's a huge tree, a beech tree. So again, you know, let's hope that they've been put into a, a, a not a roundabout, but you know, those big, as Nina was showing us pictures, the big strips of land between dual carriageways or something. Because these are huge trees. I think the other thing to look at um, is that um, when we're looking at kind of the genus of different sorts of tree, um, the next step up when you're thinking about groups of trees is the family. So it goes family, genus, species. And quite a lot of these are from the same family. So um, trees with flowers on are usually in um, the rosaceae family. So we've got a lot of these that are all from the same family, which means that they might all be susceptible to the same pests and diseases, which could be a problem. Oh, Helen's just said in the chat, what's a Zelkovia like? So, do you know, I'm not entirely sure, um, but maybe we've got people on the call who would know. I'm thinking of Mac, who's on the call, or Simon. I was, I was waiting for Simon to be honest with you, but um, come on, uh, Delcova. It's a member of the elm family. Uh, it's it's a bit smaller tree and it has more of a vase shape. Um, quite we used to use them quite a lot. Good avenue tree because they're quite uniform. Right. Okay. And, again, and Helen's also asking, what's an Austria? Austria carpinifolia, probably. Yeah. It's um. Oh, what, what's the common name, Simon? I've forgotten. It's um uh I'll show you a copy of that. It's not uh hop hornbeam. Hop hornbeam, thank you very much. So it looks very similar to hornbeams, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. I mean, some of the trees on this list are quite and, small trees, some of the sorbus are going to be rowan trees, um, and so will be very suitable for for um planting in streets. We've got 21 ginkgos. Does everybody see that? That's a nice one, and two magnolias. Okay, so um, enough about um, the different sorts of tree, which I think is fascinating, by the way, but there we go. Right, so um, Nina and I also looked at um, what kind of condition they were, where they were in by the, by the genus. And so we found that liquid ambers, most of those were in good condition, 85% of them were in good condition and then the carpinus, and then the prunus. Um, and I don't think we would find this unusual maybe that the phagus, those big beaches, weren't doing as well. So um, not doing as well, 10% of them were absent, one of them was dead. Um, but the liquid amber seems to be really enjoying being planted in Birmingham Street, so they seem to be doing really well. And they're not a native tree obviously so um there's a conversation that we can have about what kind of trees that we're planting for a warming uh, cli climate and thinking about heat islands and how hot cities get compared to say the countryside and maybe having to plant trees that are used to being in in hot areas um so that was really interesting okay let me just we looked at the dead trees. So 2.5% of the trees were dead and we wanted to see if that was any particular ones. So we found that um, the highest numbers of um, dead trees by proportion of the population, the number of trees that have been planted of that genus were, were prunus, so cherries, and the rowan trees. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, obviously, cherries and rowans, you know, they're quite small trees on the whole. You know, they should be doing fine. Um, but, but they seem to be the ones that were disproportionately more likely to be, to be dying. Um, so bears further investigation. Now, this was interesting. Um, the work this survey work has already been done in um, America 
and they've actually written a research paper all about it. And I've the link for the research paper is, is here. All of these slides, by the way, are on the Birmingham Tree People website. Um, so the, in the America, they found that trees were more likely to die if they were planted in areas of high unemployment. So I don't know whether that's about increased vandalism or people just not looking after them. I don't know. Um, but we found in Birmingham, our trees were dying in the rich places. Sutton Vesey, Bourneville, Northfield. Um, I mean, some of the, there are some in deprived wards, but um, we found that um, the percentage dead in the ward, Bourneville. So I'm, we're not entirely sure. Maybe it's a small sample size. That could be an issue. Um, but yes, it, it, we weren't. Um, our initial findings haven't borne out the findings from the USA. There was something um, that I was reading about um, trees being more likely to die if they're planted next to a bench. And I think that may be about vandalism and people sitting around on benches and pulling tree, uh, pulling branches off. But that, but that was really interesting. So there's a bit more investigation. Now, um, one of the things that Nina was talking about and showing us pictures of was the lower trunk damage. So we found 23.5% of our trees had lower trunk damage. And the usual reason for this is strimmers and the ground maintenance teams who, um, when they're doing the, ver the um, cutting the grass on the verges, um, also just kind of cutting the, the tree as well. Um, so we found that um, in areas um, where maybe there wasn't grass on the verges, we were kind of thinking, well, how come there's damage when there's no grass to cut? And we did wonder whether it was about cars parking on the verges and knocking into the trees. Um, but our research didn't really kind of bear that out. Um, places where there was there was more damage in places where the we wouldn't have expected um, cars to be parking on the verges. So again, that we need to kind of find out a bit more, have a bit more of a think about um, the lower trunk damage. We did wonder whether some of it was just due to the species of tree. So needing to kind of have a, have a look at that as well. But this is the sort of thing that we would see um, quite a bit of is um, trees being parked cars being parked really close to trees. Um, this was not uncommon at all. Yeah, so this this whole thing about um, um, not strimming. So um, we found that um, only 31% um, of the trees had um, grass at the base, um, the ones that had died. Most of them, it was just soil. So um, we're not entirely sure. We need to kind of work out why those are dying. We did find that there are more, that some of the species seem to be a bit more overrepresented than we'd expect um, for um, having lower trunk damage. So that was the prunus and the Coralis coluna, which is hazel, Turkish hazel, I think. Um, so again, it could be small sample size, but you know, just wondering why that's happening with those particular species. And this is a sort of thing that we would see. And here you think, well, there is grass there. So maybe that was strimmer damage um, or when people have cut away at the epicormic growth, maybe they've pulled it. Um, not, not sure. Oh gosh, root problems. Um, we found out quite a few um, root problems um, and there were a couple of sorts of trees that disproportionately had root problems. The crotagus, which is a hawthorn, and the liquid amber. And um, any roots, any of the trees that were loose, we reported back to Kia. Um, sometimes, you know, the um, rubber straps keeping the tree up, sometimes they would be kind of bitten into the tree so that we'd release them. I used to take a pen knife round with me 
Um, haven't been arrested yet though. And sometimes I'd take off the, um, the straps and the tree would start to fall over. And you're thinking, well, this is ridiculous. So you kind of have to kind of prop it all back again. And I would um, immediately kind of on my phone um, submit it to Kia and put down the number of the tree and just say, look, it's falling over. You need to come and deal with this. Um, so, so just interesting that, you know, what's going on with those trees that they're, they're getting loose. So we did wonder, is it about soil volumes? So um, in a street, um, when you're looking at um, where the tree is planted, um, most of the pavement is pavement, isn't it? And there's a small square usually for where the tree is. And part of the survey is to measure that space. And we kind of estimated kind of a depth of 0.4 meters. So that's not very big. But some of these trees were in tiny spaces. And I mean, you kind of hope that the tree roots are kind of going to go under the road. They're going to go under other bits of the pavement. But don't forget, there's lots of other stuff under there as well. There's also, you know, sewage pipe, electrical cables, broadband cables, um, rubble. You know, there's lots of other stuff going on under the street. It's not all just perfect, pure soil. And any soil that is under this, the road is going to be quite compacted from all the cars going over it. So very, not a very kind of nice environment for roots to, to find kind of the water and the air and the nutrients they, they need. So you have to think that, you know, for some trees, they'll be in this really tiny area to try and get their soil, their roots into the soil. So... Um, so we had to look at um, the soil volumes for the wobbly trees. So these were all the ones that were marked on, on tree plotters have as being loose and wobbly. Um, so we found that the crotagus, the hawthorn and the liquid amber were wobbly even in larger soil volumes. So I don't know, somebody with more knowledge than me is gonna have to chip in and say why they think that that could be happening, Mac or Simon. I don't know whether it's, something from the nursery I don't know I'll, I'll just I'll just add in there um <clears throat> having planted some some of the crotagus over the years I have found that some have been quite top heavy um compared with the rooting mass so I know that you know they've been quite subject to to uh, being blown around more in the winds and I suppose yeah if the if the if I'm not sure why they're not rooting out as quickly, but certainly the the weight on the crowns, particularly when they'd come in, if they had a good flowering and fruiting it was was quite a lot and probably more than the than the roots were able to hold up. But yeah, it's like I say, it probably needs a bit more investigation and research into why those are particularly not doing so well on that basis. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. I hadn't thought of that as being an issue. Um so when we look at um, all the trees that we surveyed, there were 204 that were planted in less than a cubic metre of soil. Um, and more of these were fair than the, the overall population. So that would indicate that these trees aren't doing as well as you'd expect um, from, from being in such a small soil volume, but, but negligible re really, um, but yeah, definitely an issue. Okay, um, and Nina, you might want to speak about these that you've... Oh, Ian, Max raised a hand. Max, do you want to come in? Yeah. No, just to follow up on, on what Simon was saying, absolutely bang on what Simon said. Some of the uh, rosaceae, the heads are too big for the rootstocks. And that's the other part I just wanted to add, that some of these trees may be on alternative rootstocks. Uh, and that would be the next bit. I was just having a debate with Emma in the uh, on the chat stream yeah. about we need a student to take the... Uh, the data even further and to analyze it in a bit more depth so of the trees that were wobbly how many of them were uh, were grafted how many of them were in soil volumes less than 20 cubic meters etc cetera, etc cetera. and um where did the trees come from is the other one as well are they all from the same nursery or are they all from the same part of the country those kind of things but to pare this down to give us a bit more information to inform the tree planting program yeah yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Nina, I don't know if you want to just describe what you found with these trees. And then, Mac, I know you were kind of part two of this conversation. Mm. So 
Nina, do you just want to say what's happened here? Um, we keep we find quite a few of these tilias with funny looking trunks at the bottom, basal trunk, and I just passed the information on to Mac, and then it went off from there. So I think Mac will be better right, at you. explaining this. That's great. Mac, do you want to just say what a graft is and what horrible thing is going on here, please? And what, what happened? Well, you've, you've actually, I think I mentioned this on uh, Winterbourne. The pictures there aren't as bad as some of the pictures that um, that Nina shared. Some of them were, were really terrible, really quite bad. But what we've got here is the, the bit below that line of the graft is a native elm root, a native lime rootstock, and the bit above is the Brabant, um, or it may be a different rootstock. You'd have to ask the nursery. And then we find out that the nursery actually farm out the grafting process, so they'll buy them in pre-grafted and then grow them on. Uh, and what we've got is a case of grafting compatibility, and this is most likely to be just poor horticultural standards, so poor craftsmanship, and they weren't grafted and didn't go well. These might recover, but many of the ones that Nina's team found were too far gone. And of course, in correlation with how much you pay for them, so they're substantially more expected, ex expensive because they're grafted trees and they're more likely to fail because they haven't been grafted properly. So it's kind of a false economy. Um, and I know why I know why um, Akia are doing this because obviously we don't want to plant standard lime trees because of the issues with aphid problems and root suckers and basal suckers and epicormic growth. So they're looking for other species, but this may not be the direction to go in based on the work that the BTP have been doing, obviously. Yeah, I mean, they look awful, but does it mean that the tree is more likely to fall over or die? Depends if the, if the graft recovers and if enough cambium forms around it, no problem at all. And I said, these are, are maybe, maybe not. I would have thought the one on the left, not such a problem. But the other ones that Nina supplied, we've got some much worse pictures. Almost certainly there'll be a tree failure at some stage in the future. If the tree may just die, it may actually just fail. Right, right. So really needs to be addressed at an early stage where it's cheaper to just take a small tree out than wait for a large tree to fall over. Or buy a tree that didn't have those problems. Yeah. One of those things I think that we've got running this autumn is that we'll have um, uh, urban forestry volunteers at the point of delivery. Uh, because these trees aren't checked by anybody with any knowledge when they're delivered. So you might get a wagon load of trees turn up in the yard at Thimble Mill or Cofton or somewhere. We're hoping to have people there on site at the time to take the delivery uh, and undertake an inspection of the trees to see that they are what they've actually ordered. And then also to do formative pruning and check the grafts. So in order, so we can just send the trees back that don't meet the right standards. That's great. So we'll be looking for volunteers to do that and we'll give training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. And um, so one of my pet peeves is about this tree in particular, Tilia tormentosa, because I think I'm right. This is the one that kills bees. Yes, got the right one. Have I, Mac? Sorry, I'm on mute. Sorry. Yes, you have. Yeah, yeah. So this one... Um, the bees like the um, have the nectar from the flowers, but they can't digest it, so they die of. Oh, it's horrible! It's horrible. So whether we should be planting this one at all, uh, anyway, in the first place. Right. Okay. So that was one of the issues that that we found. Um, oh gosh, stakes and vandalism. Wow. Um, quite a few of the trees still had stakes um, with the rubber ties on at over five years. So we found 10% of them had this. Um, where the, um, the rubber tie is um, eating into the tree, so the tree at that point can't grow anymore because the tie is too tight, we, we were cutting them off so that the tree could um, continue to grow. Um, we had 14 trees that were commented on as being vandalized. So either snapped off like the picture here um, or ring barked. Um, and the, the, the ties kind of form a really good kind of pivot point for um, vandalism really. Um, so 
not very good at all. Um, but I think we've got a picture. Let me just show you the next. I think we've got a picture of some of the, the vandalism. Um, so this one, I think Nina, is this one because somebody doesn't want the tree outside their house? No, the one that was ring barked was the... Right, let me... Um, I think, the one. I think it's the next slide. I think it's the next one. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, the the bus the resident extended their drive, and the tree was in the way. He did have um, yeah. So I, we couldn't prove it. Um, I came across it was supposed to be surveyed. I did report it to Kia, and they removed it and replanted another tree there, and that one's still alive. Oh, that's good. That's good. I mean, it's such a sad thing for people to do, isn't it? But I guess it's kind of that lack of, lack of education about the importance of trees. And one of, I think, the really positive things um, going around doing tree surveying is how many conversations you get into about trees and people wanting asking you what you're up to and um, why you're doing it and just being able to explain a bit about some of the benefits of having trees outside your home and along your street. Um, but yeah, just really sad to see to see this. Um, okay, so just looking at the kind of climate emergency, because um, obviously this is like one of the huge issues at our time, and um, I think the UN has us on code red at the moment for for climate um, emergency and global warming. Um, so this is about um, how much sunlight a um, a tree can get access to. So we've got a variable called crown exposure. And if you could, um, if a tree was able to get sunlight from all the way around and on top, um, it would get a really good score. But obviously some of our um, trees are in very narrow spaces with buildings on, on either side. Um, and so um, they don't get as much um, sunlight as possible. Um, but actually, you know, to be in shade might be quite a good thing um, as our temperatures rise. And certainly, um, you know, there was a, a piece in New Scientist the other day about people saying that actually you can get to a point where the trees get too hot um, and the and the leaves start to shrivel, they get scorched. Um, and so actually, you know, it might be quite good to not have as many out completely in, in the view of the sun. Um, but obviously they do provide a huge amount of shade and cooling for us. So um, having lots of trees around us because um, they do this thing where water comes out of their leaves through transpiration and that kind of cools down the whole area around them, which is really good for humans and also um, kind of local wildlife as well. Um, but obviously kind of drought is a big issue. Um, just under 60% of the trees had water pipes or water bags. Um, because as we were saying earlier, you know, um, they've got limited root run. Um, and when they've just been planted, um, they need as much water as they can. So um, now Kia put on our please water me tags onto all the new trees, just asking neighbours, you know, if it's been a really hot summer um, to, to water the new the newly planted street trees. Um, just under 88 percent of the trees weren't mulched. So any any water would evaporate off from the bottom, which is a shame. Um, and we found like a really tiny tree pit. So in terms of how that tree gets water, um, you know, it's, that's going to be a struggle for them. Um, I'm just thinking about whether we should talk about how roots kind of go into water pipes and things like that, um, because obviously trees need water. And if they if they root finds a a crack in a water pipe they will go in and that's why you get this whole thing about oh tree roots blocking drains and things like that but if that's the only place they're going to get water from yes of course they're going to try and go there so um you know we've we, I mean my personal view is that you know trees are definitely part of how we um combat um heat islands and how hot it gets in cities um, and we need to plant more in streets to cool us down. But obviously that's really difficult when you've got such narrow streets um, and um, kind of limited um, 
area for the canopy to grow without it kind of hitting people's windows and getting in the way of overhead cables and things. But I think this is something that cities are going to have to try and sort out. OK, so. I think some of the main things that we found was that the species of tree is really important to how successful it's going to grow in a, in a street. Um, and we think we've got some information about what's doing well. So to be honest, it's kind of non-natives. Um, and we've got some kind of queries about some of the trees that we're, we're not quite sure why as a species they're not doing so well, like the Crotagus, the Hawthorn. So um, we really need to be looking at species. And one of the things that we need to be looking at is as we have an increasingly warmer summer, as our winters get wetter, what are the kinds of trees that are going to do well? And um, it might be that we want to plant oak trees, but do we need to be planting oak trees from acorns of trees that are from southern Spain or places that have kind of acclimatized to being very hot in the summer? So I think that's going to be a really interesting um, debate about how we include more kind of non-natives and what the impact on wildlife is going to be if we do that. Um, I did hear that in London, there's um, somewhere in London, they've started planting citrus trees in, as street trees because it, they don't get any frost. Um, so that would be really interesting to try if we've got any areas of Birmingham. I think there's probably some sheltered places where we can we can plant those kinds of trees. Um, so I think the second point is we have loads of data. We really have masses of data. Um, and honestly, Nina and I just picked the things that we thought were interesting. And I think somebody with more arboricultural knowledge and more knowledge of how to um, work with Excel and Power BI would be able to pull out loads of really interesting stuff. And of course, the more data that we add into Tree Plotter, the more confidence we can have in the statistics that we're pulling out from it. So, you know, it's definitely, we just want to say we need to keep going with the tree survey. Um, you know, we would like to know why trees are dying, but with such small numbers, it's difficult to kind of pull out um, any kind of definite recommendations or views on that. So we'll be continuing to add to Tree Plotter um, to just make sure we've got a really big sample size. Um, and also, I think as you're going along um, surveying trees, we certainly found that we needed to add on that um, one about car parking and car congestion, because in Birmingham, it is such a big issue, people parking on pavements and on verges and knocking over trees to make them more wobbly or just parking really close and compacting the soil around the tree. So we, we knew that we had to add that on. And there might be other variables that we think, oh, OK, we need to start looking at that um, because that would be really interesting to look at. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get at some point a university student or somebody who's a bit keen on um, statistics and trees who, who might want to kind of do a bit more of a deep dive on all the, the statistics that we've got, because obviously we've got a lot of data there. Um, and at the moment, yes, we've done this kind of interim report, but the, there could be a lot more. Um, I'm, I'm not going to suggest a PhD, but possibly a PhD. <laughs> Um, if you went really into it. We did find um, that there's been really some just fantastic positives out of this. I mentioned earlier about the conversations that we were having on the street. And in fact, um, Willie, one of our tree surveyors just said, look, we need a leaflet. So he kind of wrote a leaflet. And now um, we put a leaflet through people's doors who've got a street tree in front of their house. And we say what species it is um, and when it was planted. And it just asks them to kind of look after it and water it and take care of it. Um, but it was really good to have those conversations. And I think people genuinely want to have street trees for all the people that were moaning about the blossoms falling on their cars. There were about 10 or 12 people who said, oh, it's really lovely. I really love the view of the leaves from my from my window. So um, definitely people more interested than not. Um, 
we've also got, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the Please Water Me tree tags and Kia are putting those on every newly planted street tree now. And you'll see that the new street trees have actually got a um, kind of chicken wire grill that goes around them. Um, and that was to try and stop people tampering with the tree, like breaking off um, branches low down or ring barking, things like that. Unfortunately, quite a lot of them are now being used as litter bins. Um, but, oh, you know, we'll, we'll get that sorted. We'll get that sorted. Um, I, I also feel that the Street Tree Survey has been a really good way to introduce volunteers to not only surveying work, um, but also aspects of tree care. So um, when we're doing the survey, we do do a bit of um, formative pruning um, and we'd also look for kind of diseases, um, definitely looking for damage. And as usual, you're, you're trying to have a go at species identification. One of the good things about when you're doing the survey, because you've got the map from, the, you've got the details from the database, it tells you what species you should be looking for. Um, but they don't always label them correctly. So a small percentage are not correct. So you're looking at something which you think, oh, that should be a lime tree, but it's obviously an oak tree because you can tell by the leaves. So um, it's quite good with the species identification. And I think the doing the survey work meant that um, the people who went on to do the eye tree survey had already got experience of what they were looking for in a survey and how to do it. So I think um, it's, it's, it's been good um, kind of experience to go on and do further survey work. Um, and it also helped us kind of highlight topics that we needed to cover for the, to, for the monthly training as kind of things were coming up. So, you know, all in all, just a really um, interesting um, project and um, we're going to keep going with it, aren't we, Nina? We are. We are. We've okay. got a lot of trees to survey. Yes, yes, we've got thousands of trees to survey. So that was a, a quick run through of where we are now. To be honest, I've not been keeping an eye on the chat, so I'm hoping that other people have been answering questions in there. But is there anything in there that we, we need to cover that hasn't been answered yet? I don't know. Mac or Simon, I think you've been. Yeah, we could keep up with the chat, I think. Uh, and I uh, don't think there were many questions, only a few about the tree species earlier. So we've done those. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and just a bit about who we're going to get to crunch some more data. So, <laughs> yes, yes, still looking for somebody. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and yeah, so Valerie's put a point in here about the eye tree survey. Um, so the eye tree survey that was done sampled 450 plots in Birmingham. This survey is looking specifically at street trees. And um, Nina, you've got the statistics on how many street trees um, we've still got, I think, to do. Yeah, we've got about 5,000 to go. <laughs> we've done 1,516 so far. So still plenty of scope for anybody who's interested in, in having a go at... Um, at doing some survey work but yeah we've done a lot we've done a lot um I have to say it's slightly easier doing the trees when they've got leaves on just so that you know in winter it's a bit more difficult to kind of judge um like the canopy and things like that and it's also jolly cold when you're holding your pen and filling yeah. things in in the winter so I've done a bit of that with with some friends and oh gosh it was really we only did a few trees because it was so cold um, but yes, there's definitely time left this autumn and then maybe to start again in March to do it. But it's yeah. definitely a worthwhile thing to do. I don't know, um, Mac or Nina, have you got anything else you'd like to add or if there's any more questions? That's OK. If anyone's interested in doing street surveying, just contact me and then we can meet up and have a chat and you can have a go. Yeah, right. we absolutely definitely need to add more. And the reason we need to add more is that um, Kia plant a thousand trees in the streets every year. So if we're only doing 1,500 every two years, we're dropping by 25% behind the pace. Yeah. So just to keep up, we need a lot more, let alone to actually catch up. Um, so there's a problem there. If you want any more data, one of those great things that's happened in the last week 
that you may not have picked up on. Tree Plotter have, um, have given us some more free stuff. Um, so if you, if anybody can access Tree Plotter, if you can't, just ask. We can show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go to Tree Plotter and then to the hub, you've got some data options there, which will give you street trees by diversity, by size, by age. And it will also do the 10, 20, 30 thing for you as well. So the stuff that, um, that Tanya and Nina have been talking about, the information you can actually run across all of the street trees now. Um, so quite easily, you can run the data yourself. So it's available to everybody. That's good. I'm just going to jump in in front of you, Emma. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say that, Mac. I mean, I understand that point about how many trees Kira are planting each year. Uh, and I think, again, this is where somebody who really understands how those sort of statistics work, that actually, how many of those do we need to be surveying before we actually stop seeing any new results? Mm. Because I think, you know, there, there may be some way of looking at, you know, we need to do a statistical sample across those because, you know, like you say, We've got, you know, if we're if we're not if we can't keep up with a thousand a year, and we're going to try and review all of them, it's gonna it is going to just keep going. And at what point then do those trees become eight, nine, ten years old before we get round to them? So yeah, so it's, uh, if we're if we're saying planting within the last five years, we need to have a bit of a review. I think anyway. Sorry, you know. That's a good point. Yeah, your hand up. I was going to ask if um, you'd spoken to by four because we do have volunteers that sign up to do stuff. Have any of those been able, D would know whether any of the by four volunteers could help with tree surveying? Yeah, we'll we'll speak to D. I think I think she's tried in the past to get people. Um, for some reason, they were super keen on doing the eye tree survey, but that might be because it was paid. OK, yeah, absolutely. Definitely, Tonya. Yeah, we, we were inundated with the Birmingham Uni students for the eye tree thing, but we failed miserably trying to engage with some for the um, street trees and for all the, the other stuff we were doing as well. What about uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award? Can we, can we get uh, secondary school children doing it? That's an idea. Yes, Maybe it? King Edwards, because there's six of them, isn't there? Did it, hopefully they link up. Yeah. I, I could try the University of Birmingham school as my son goes there. Perfect. Thank you. That would be great. Uh, I won't recommend Dame Elizabeth Cadbury's. Um, uh, nobody answers my emails about anything. I can't believe they'll answer one about a street tree survey. Okay. Um, so, yeah, by four volunteers. With regards to geographers, um, Mac, we spoke to Leslie Batty a year or so ago. I think she's still the link for projects. That would be the best place to find a geographer. I can offer engineering pro projects, but the students will come away with a degree in engineering. So we need to make sure there's sufficient engineering content within any research projects that they do, which means that they can look at some stuff, but they couldn't do a very ARB based project. But they could do infrastructure damage. <laughs> Uh, what sort of damage? Well, damage. If, you, if you were taking a, an entire street as a sample and you've got mature yeah. young trees, distance to damage, footway displacement, walls, curbs, um, carriageway, uh, infrastructure, maybe underground cables and those pipes or above ground even. So there's so, tons of engineering opportunities there. And then we're looking at the relationship between the urban form and the, the damage to the trees. Say again, sorry. Looking at the relationship between the built environment and the damage to the trees. Well, the damage that the trees cause, not necessarily the damage to the trees. Oh, okay, the other way around. The okay. Way around. Yeah, so that would engage the engineering students because it becomes an infrastructure question. They're always interested in, they are always interested in trees. Okay. I mean, and there's three dead trees in front of the School of Engineering at the moment. They have been for a year. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know. Anyway. We can we can chat another time about this, uh, Mac. But I get a load of students now, and then again in six months who are master students. Brilliant. Maybe what we could do to get this to move this on, because that's the bit that we'll. I mean, I'm not speaking at the top of Nina, hopefully, but that's the bit that's the ton of information, and we're using about ten percent of it at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's absolutely right. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for all those suggestions and questions and I hope you found that really interesting we're certainly going to keep going with the street tree survey oh Mac is that your hand up well you yeah, just to say yeah I made a comment in the chat earlier on we've um 
we've been moving our attention recently towards housing. We only do highways because that's the only information we've got because Kia gave it to us. But we have had some housing data recently for the Newtown Ward. Uh, and and the, um, the, the, the problem's even worse. So we analysed, obviously, the highway trees for genus and species and family. There's a problem. Um, there's an even bigger problem with the um, diversity that they're actually planting, because they're only really planting, as Nina alluded to, rosaceae. So it's going to skew it even further. But we got we got a 10, 20, 30 problem all the way across Newtown. When we put the data onto um, onto a spreadsheet, it immediately became obvious that 37% of all the trees were from the rose family. Uh, and it ticked, it ticked the first two to 10, 20, or 30 and 20 box. Um, oh, I think we may have an even bigger problem with our diversity in housing because they're more likely to plant smaller trees and those trees are more likely to come from the rose family. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, I, I was just going to say, housing aren't planting any trees, are they? We know it's parks that plant trees in the housing land, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah planting yeah. on housing land. Yeah, exactly. on housing land, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could let the housing officers know because why, why would they know? But... Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. So we were just doing an hour session today, um, and it's coming up for 11 o'clock. So just an absolutely huge thank you for your time this morning, and hope you found it interesting. The slides are all on the Birmingham Tree People website. If you'd like to do some survey work, please contact Nina. Nina, do you want to put your email in the chat, just so people have got it, if they want to contact you? Yes, I'll do that now. Perfect, thank you. And um, yeah, um, I'm going to stop the